you see them from the day. There's a story that recounts the return of Jesus to glory after his time and his ministry on earth. Even in heaven, he bore the marks of his earthly pilgrimage with his cruel cross and the shameful death that he had suffered. The angel Gabriel approached him and said, Master, you must have suffered terribly for me. Oh, I did, Jesus said. And Gabriel went on, do they know about how you loved him? Do they know about what you did for them? And Jesus said, well, right now, only a handful of people in Palestine know these things. And Gabriel was somewhat perplexed by that. Then what have you done? He said. What have you done to let everyone know about your love? To let everyone know what you did for them. And Jesus said, oh, I'd ask Peter and James and John and some other men, other friends, to tell that story about me. To tell my story and spread it to the farthest regions of the globe. And ultimately, all of mankind will have heard about me, about my life, about what I've done. But Gabriel was still not convinced. He was still skeptical. Because he knew what poor stuff men were made of. Yes, but what if Peter and James and John and the others grow weary? What if people who come after them don't hear the story? Or what if people who come after them forget the story? What about centuries in the future? People just don't talk about you. They don't tell others about you. Haven't you made any other plans? And Jesus answered, I haven't made any other plan. I'm counting on them. And now, 20 centuries later, he still has no other plan. Today, he's still counting on you, and he's still counting on me to tell that great story. High on God's to-do list is the evangelization of the world. Jesus' early disciples adopted his priorities, and they devoted themselves to reaching their world with this story, with this message. Christ counted on them, and they delivered. Christ counts on us now. Are we delivering? Are we telling the story? Are we fulfilling the charge that he left with all of his disciples to believe the world? And to teach that gospel to everyone that we encounter or that will listen to us. How can we be the kind of sowers of the seed? That is, how can we be the kind of sowers of the word of God that brings a harvest of souls into God's kingdom? The parable of the sower that you find there in Matthew 13, Mark 4, and again in Luke chapter 8. That parable is a story of evangelism. It might be called the parable of the seed. It might be called the parable of the soils, as well as the parable of the souls. But evangelism, the carrying of the gospel to all people, is responsibility given to the people of God. This parable is somewhat unique. In that Jesus explained its meaning fully to his disciples. He wanted them to get the message. He wanted them to fully understand the teaching of this story. 
Like all the parables, the illustration, the story itself was taken from everyday life. The experiences of people who lived in the world. Things that his hearers and their hearers would be familiar with. But also, like all the parables, the message goes much deeper than just the facts of the story. We're going to look at this story. We're going to look at its message from three different perspectives. Today we're going to focus upon the sower himself or herself. Look at the individual doing the sowing. What are the characteristics of that good sower? What does he or she have to bring to this task in order to successfully produce the harvest? And we're going to focus this morning on four points. Good sowers are committed, they are caring, they are humble, and they are expectant. Those four things. Then next week, our second view will be upon the soils. That upon which the seed is sown. Soils are different. Some are more receptive than others. Some are better prepared to receive, receive the seed than others. Some become more productive than others. And then the third of the series will center on just one word. And that's the imperative that Jesus left with his disciples. The word go. Go. The seed is always good. No question about that. If the seed is the word of God, as Jesus explained the parable, then the seed is always good. The soils may be receptive. Some are, some aren't. So they may be receptive for the seed. And the sower can be well equipped, can be willing to carry out his or her responsibility. But the sower must still go to sow. That's there in Matthew 13 and verse 3. They had to go out to sow. Those places where the word will be planted don't always come to us. We must go and make contact with those different receptive souls. Because evangelism requires action. It always has and it always will. It requires action on our part. We're to work to serve God. We sow. Well, how do we sow? We teach. We encourage. We guide people to an understanding of the gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ. And we encourage them to answer for themselves the question of their spiritual situation, their spiritual condition. To let them discover for themselves where they are in their relationship with God. Yes, they're his creation, but are they his child? Are they really his child? And then it's God who brings the harvest. It's God who saves souls. We are just the instruments to accomplish the great result. Necessary. Significant, but we are just the instruments that then allows God to produce that harvest. And the fact is, in fact, it's always been, and it will always be. There is no other point. There is no other point. There's just no other way. For the Lord's body to grow. There's no other way. For the church. To grow. For God's kingdom. To be advanced. For the father's family. To become larger. 
there is no other plan. If we don't carry out our responsibility, it just won't get done. God's not going to force anyone to do anything they do not choose to do. God's not going to save souls who are not responsive to that message. God's not going to bring into his family those who are not willing to obey him and the message that his son left upon this earth. It's not going to happen unless we sow the seed. It's not going to happen unless we tell the story. From the general, we must become more specific. When we look at the question of what makes for a good sower of seed, the general view takes into account the life of the sower. The specific view also has to focus upon that life. Effective evangelism requires not only an attractive message, but it also requires an attractive messenger. And I don't mean attractive in the physical sense. There have to be effective messengers who can carry that word, but they in their own lives have to have an attraction to those to whom they are speaking. You can offer someone something that looks great, Let's say you had, or I had here, uh, an apple. A nice, shiny, red apple. And there are a few people that don't like apples. We may encounter one or two along the way, but most people like a good, delicious, juicy apple. It's pleasant to the eye. Tempting to anyone who has that love. But if you offer that apple to someone with a hand that has sores on it, or a hand that is dirty, filthy, unwashed, no matter how good that apple looks, no matter how good it might taste, that repulsive hand is going to keep people from taking it. Not really good one. I know the apple probably is very good, but I'll pass. The gospel of Jesus Christ, as good as it is, as attractive as it should be, must be offered from an equally good and attractive, not a repulsive life and lifestyle. The messenger and the message are two different things. We understand that. We recognize that. But the message can't get through if the messenger doesn't demonstrate its power and its goodness in his or her own life.